Andreas. My name is Andreas Hadzakis. I'm a solutions architect based out of London. But as you can probably tell from my accent, uh, I'm not originally from the UK. Before joining Amazon, I was in Athens where I was a co-founder of a Greek startup. Together with us today, we also have Chris Pitchford from News UK. And uh, News UK is running WordPress at scale. So I'm sure there are some very valuable learnings that uh, Chris is going to share with us today. Who is uh, running WordPress uh, today? Can you show your hands? OK, quite a few people. Well, if you aren't, maybe you're here because you want to learn what's the fastest way to get started. Uh, but essentially, as your website is growing, um, you're probably interested to, sa to save on cost, spend less money for infrastructure. So how do we make our WordPress installation as efficient as possible? and also give our end users the best possible experience. And of course, this is AWS reInvent, so many people are interested in scalability. But WordPress was only designed originally to run on a single host. So what kind of architectures do we need to put in place? Uh, we want to highlight some pitfalls, some common mistakes, and also give you very specific configuration details so that you can go back and implement those architectures straight away without the trial and error. Later on, Chris is going to give us a good idea of what is required to empower a whole organization with rapid deployment tools for WordPress to uh, be able to launch new websites very quickly, from microsites to very <coughs> complex, large websites. And before we go any further, Let's make sure everyone is familiar with the basic structure of WordPress. We're going to refer to that during this talk, so it's important. So let's start with the WP config file. This is where WordPress stores all the basic configuration, things like the database endpoint and the credentials. Then the admin folder holds the application code for the administrative portion of the website. This is what allows your editors to add new content. And we have the WP content folder. This is for everything that is not part of the WordPress distribution, but is um, user defined. So for example, we have the plugins. There, there's a plethora of plugins out there that allow you to extend WordPress. All of a sudden, you don't just have a website, but you can have an e-commerce platform or a collaboration tool for your organization. And then we have the themes. In this folder, we are storing sets of template files that give us full control over the user interface. We can customize it completely. And then we have the uploads folder for all the media files, for example, images that the contributors of the website upload to associate with specific posts. This is stored by default on the local file system. We're going to see later on how this is a problem and a challenge when we want to do auto-scaling. And finally, we have the includes folder. This is where WordPress stores the core libraries, the, the core assets that come with a, a WordPress distribution. So how do we get started? And uh, just to give some context, let me give you a fictional story. Let's imagine that a friend of, me, of mine back in London a few years ago opened a Greek restaurant. And uh, today he has a chain of restaurants and an e-commerce platform, and it's all based uh, his online presence is all, always based on WordPress. But initially, the, he just needed a single server, and he asked my help. I was a bit lazy, so instead of installing everything on my own, I visited the AWS marketplace, and I saw that there are numerous offerings from third parties. Those uh, offerings are in the form of a AMIs, Amazon Machine Images. And I picked one of those, and I launched an EC2 instance just in a few minutes. And this came pre-installed with Apache, MySQL, WordPress. It was ready to go. The only thing that I had to do was to attach an Elastic IP address to that. And then I used Route 53 to register the domain name and point it to my server. The initial decision I had to take was what kind of instance type should I use? And in this particular case, initially such a low traffic website, I went for a T2 instance. T2 instances are very cost efficient for such a workload. 
If you're doing anything a bit more substantial, an M3 instance is probably more suitable for that stable workload. It has more capacity. And your case might be different, depending on the complexity of the plugins that you have installed for WordPress, the size of your database. You might have different requirements. And one day, my friend called me. His website was not functioning. Turns out that the EC2 instance, due to a hardware failure, was terminated. Luckily, I had set up backups, automated backups, so I was able to restore the website very quickly. And here you can see my checklist in order to be able to recover a WordPress website. Of course, you need a way to restore the operating system, all the packages, WordPress, and the configuration. That is all part of the AMI that I used. But then we have more dynamic content. We need a recent backup of the database. And the WP content folder, remember, this is where we store all the themes, the plugins, and the user uploads. You can use a WordPress plugin for that. There are plugins that will create a zip file and store it on S3. But I wanted a slightly more efficient way. So what I did was that I added an EBS volume. And I created symbolic links for everything that is dynamic, everything that changes after I launched my AMI, things like the MySQL folder and the WP content folder, perhaps even the config file if you plan to change this often. Now, in the scenario of failure of my EC2 instance, I can simply launch a replacement node from the same AMI, and I can reattach the EBS volume and the Elastic IP address, and the website works again. I can either uh, even fully automate this process with some help from auto-scaling and a simple script. That is not the only failure case scenario. The EBS volume itself can fail, or we can always have the human error. For example, my friend logging into the admin panel, accidentally deleting some files. That's why we also need to have backups into S3, and this takes the form of EBS snapshots. Now, EBS snapshots are very cost efficient because they are incremental backups. So we only store the blocks that have changed since the previous backup. And the restaurant of my friend was a great success. So very quickly, uh, I observed some performance issues, especially on Fridays when many people are looking for a restaurant for their weekend. Before migrating to a larger instance, which is very easy to perform, I wanted to make sure that I was making the most of what I already had. So I read some conflicting advice on the internet on how to optimize Apache and MySQL. I also had some books for my Kindle with, the, with those subjects. To be honest, I spent too much time doing micro-optimizations, and I'm not an expert on this. I'm not even sure I got it right. That's why I'm very keen to come tomorrow to watch the session with that topic, how to optimize your web server on AWS. It's at 11 o'clock at the same room. But in the meantime, there are a lot of other things we can do. Architectural changes, changes that can have a significant impact. And those changes are not supported by WordPress out of the box. We will need to use some plugin. There are plenty of solutions out there. I will highlight a specific plugin it's called W3 Total CAS. It's not the only possible solution, and it has some limitations. Later on, Chris from News UK is going to explain why they developed their own plugins. But this is a plugin that we've seen in use in various production environments at our customers. So the first thing I want to do, and we saw S3 before in the context of backups, but S3 is a lot more than that. We can store all our static assets on S3, things like the JavaScript files, the CSS files, and the images. And we can then serve them directly from S3. S3 will act as a highly available and scalable hosting solution for those static assets. By doing so, we are reducing the load on our web server. Maybe we can save money by using a smaller instance. It is also a very important step to achieve a stateless architecture. We're going to see later on why this is a prerequisite before we can do auto-scaling. And I want to highlight a common mistake here. You could install something like S3FS. S3FS is an open source 
tool. It is useful in some scenarios. But it, S3FS is trying to emulate a file system on top of S3. And S3 is a web service, so this works over HTTP, so there is some overhead there. But the biggest problem is not that. The biggest problem is that with this architecture, we are actually not offloading serving of static assets to S3. We are storing them on S3, yes, but it's still the web server that will fetch those and serve them to our end users. Instead, we want to use a WordPress plugin that will integrate properly into S3. And what do I mean by that? I mean that the plugin is going to use the APIs of S3 to store the assets directly there instead of the local file system. And then when we produce the HTML output for our end users, any reference in, inside the HTML code on static assets, like images, will have this format. It will have the prefix of the S3 bucket endpoint, and then the path and the object name. Like this, my, the browsers of my end users are going to fetch this object directly from S3, which is what I wanted to achieve. And W3 Total Cast that I mentioned before is such a plugin that uh, I can do that. Next, we want to, uh, to have as quickly a quick loading for our page as possible. One thing we can do to improve this is to take advantage of the browser's local cache. So a returning visitor who has already downloaded the CSS file should not have to re-download it every time uh, the, the web page is visited. And how does the browser know for how long to cache an object? We can dictate that by returning the right HTTP headers with our responses, things like the cache control header and the expires header. We can implement that at the web server level, either by customizing the vhost configuration or by using an HT access file. A more elegant way is to use a suitable WordPress plugin. And then the same HTTP headers are useful also in a different context when using Amazon CloudFront to serve either static or dynamic content. It's the same headers that dictate for how long should Amazon CloudFront cast those objects closer to the end users at the edge locations. And Amazon CloudFront can serve cacheable but also non-cacheable content. And of course, the benefit is larger when we have cacheable content. But for non-cacheable content, Amazon CloudFront is going to perform network level optimizations to deliver the content more quickly to our end users. If you want to understand more about how this works, there is a recording on our YouTube channel from last year's session with the title Dynamic Content Acceleration. But essentially what we are saying is that we want to serve the whole website through CloudFront. And CloudFront can have multiple origins in this case, we will have an S3 bucket for the static content and an EC2 instance for the dynamic content. And we're going to configure different rules. We call them CloudFront behaviors. Each CloudFront behavior depends on a specific path pattern and dictates where to fetch a particular object from and also how to treat things like cookies and HTTP headers. In practice, you might want to have a separate distribution for your static assets, and you might want to set up multiple aliases to the same distribution, multiple subdomains that point to the same assets. The reason for that is that most browsers will place a limit on the number of concurrent downloads you can have from a single host name. But if we spread our requests to multiple subdomains, we can have a higher throughput which will result in a better experience for our end users. And this is an example configuration that you need to set up to serve the whole website through CloudFront. This, is, this works for WordPress out of the box, but uh, depending on the plugins you might have installed, you will need to extend this. You will have the access to the slides, so I will just highlight some specific, more interesting bits here. So here on the, on the left, you can see the static content configuration. 
Here I'm leaving more or less the default values. But for the query strings, I'm going to forward them through CloudFront. Now, these are static assets. Why do we need query strings? They don't accept any parameters. The reason is that if we imagine that we have a CSS file and we want to modify this, our problem is that this is already cast both at the browsers and on CloudFront. We can add a version identifier parameter. This has no functionality at all, but now both for the browser and for CloudFront, it's a new file. So this is how we introduce a change and solve that problem. When it comes to cookies and headers, they don't affect in any way how S3 is going to serve a particular object. So we don't need cookies and headers. That's why I have them disabled. If I would enable them, and because the headers can have many different values, CloudFront would treat all those as separate versions, would cast them separately. So the caching efficiency would be much lower. A lot more requests would have to go back to the origin instead of being served directly from the edge locations of CloudFront. And for dynamic content, I'm going to make a distinction for the login page and the admin folder. Here, I want to enforce the use of HTTPS for security reasons. And when it comes to cookies and headers, I'm going to keep things very simple and whitelist all of the headers and cookies. I, I'm not very interested here in caching. This is a very dynamic portion of the website and very personalized. Maybe I have some plugins that depend on a header. I want to make sure that I have maximum compatibility here. But it's a very different story for the front end. Anything else that is dynamic, here I care a lot about the caching efficiency. So I will only whitelist specific cookies. Only the cookies that vary the output of WordPress. Any cookies that are used by third party solutions, for example, if I'm using a cookie for my analytics, I don't want to send that back to the origin through CloudFront. And when it comes to headers, again, the same principle, I will only allow specific headers that I'm interested in. And here you can see in my example, I have whitelisted four headers the CloudFront protocol header, and the device detection headers. Let's see why we need those and how we can use those. So we are serving portions of our website, potentially both via HTTP or HTTPS. So some pages are loaded via different protocols. We want to cast those as different versions, because when I load a page through HTTPS, I cannot mix the protocols. So also, my HTML code will be different. We'll load any JavaScript files also through HTTPS. That's why I want to cache those separately, even if it's the same page. And then we are terminating the HTTPS tunnel at the edge location instead of our web server. This has significant benefits, especially if I have many users connecting through HTTPS. I'm terminating all those tunnels at CloudFront, of course. I can still have a second tunnel between CloudFront and my origin to have end-to-end -end encryption. But this is a very efficient way of doing that. Because we serve SSL traffic through CloudFront, we need to upload our own custom SSL certificate. And we have two options for that with CloudFront. One is to take advantage of the SNI protocol, and the other is to use the dedicated IP option. Both are equal in terms of security, but SNI comes without any extra cost. The drawback is that it's not compatible with older browsers. Of course, if the only users that visit your website through HTTPS are your administrators, the administrators of the website, I'm sure you can tell them to use modern browsers so that you don't have any problem here. Otherwise, if you have many users with SSL, perhaps you have an e-commerce plugin and you have an e-commerce solution, then you, you do care about having compatibility with all the browsers. And then the other three headers, excuse me, the other three headers, the, the device detection headers, are useful in a different scenario. I want to tailor the experience for people that come through different devices, mobile devices, tablets, 
And I can, of course, use client-side logic. For example, I can use CSS3 media queries to make the output, my graphical user interface, more readable in smaller screens, in mobile phones. But there will be scenarios where I want to use server-side logic to modify also the HTML code. Here, going back to our story with that restaurant, you can see how my friend has the tendency to upload very large images. And those would give a very poor experience to the mobile device users. I want to customize the output to serve a different file depending on the device. So here is how I built that. I customized the template of WordPress to introduce some conditional logic that will modify the HTML output depending on the CloudFront device type headers. These are three device type headers, one for desktop, one for tablet, one for mobile, and they take a true or false value. So based on that, I can build my customization. And those headers will take their value depending on the user agent header of the browser. You could, of course, use the user agent header directly. The problem is that the user agent header has many different potential values. So this is much more efficient from a caching point of view. The next change I want to do is an infrastructure one. I want to move the database off my web server. I am separating web and database. Now those two workloads do not antagonize for the same set of shared resources but also I can optimize my selection of instance types. Maybe I need to have a memory-optimized instance, like an R3, for my database. It will benefit from more RAM. Instead, the, C the web server may be CPU-bound and uh, would benefit from a C3 instance. Of course, for the database, you probably want to use the relational database service, RDS, and take advantage of all the efficiency so that you don't have to manage the database engine on a day-to-day -day basis. Just be aware that if you're using the WordPress multi-site, this is the functionality that the WordPress has to support multiple websites from a single installation, you're adding nine tables every time you're adding a new website. Now, if you have hundreds of websites, you will have uh, maybe thousands of tables in your database. Just be aware that if you're using RDS with magnetic storage, you shouldn't have more than 1,000 tables. And if you're using provision IOPS, you can have up to 10,000 tables. The reason is that if you have more than those, you can affect negatively the, uh, the ability of the RDS database to perform crash recovery in a timely manner. In some occasions, you could use the SSD-backed uh, storage, the GP2 uh, storage, Depending on the size, you might have enough capacity to perform crash recovery in a fast manner. But this is something that you should test depending on the number of tables you have. Next, because WordPress is a read-heavy application, we can use an in-memory caching solution to store the results of commonly requested queries. So if I have database queries that are perhaps expensive and are very frequent, I don't need to go back to the database all the time. I can store the result in something like Memcached. Memcached is an open source caching solution that stores the results in RAM. So we can give a better experience to our end users because we respond quicker to uh, database queries. And also we are reducing the load on the database. You can install Memcached on your web server or even better, you can take advantage of Elastic Cache, which is a service that is fully managed and gives you the ability to launch new clusters very easily. WordPress itself does not support Memcached, but this is why we need to install plugins like the W3 Total Cache plugin that I mentioned earlier. Going back to our story, my friend now added an e-commerce plugin and started selling Greek wines to the whole world. It was now important that his website would be highly available. Any disruption would mean potential revenue loss. So I adapted his architecture with that objective in mind. 
I introduced a second web server in a different availability zone. And I placed those behind the Elastic Load Balancing Service. I used auto-scaling, not to scale at this point in time, but just to make sure that I have a fixed number of healthy instances always running. And then I configured Elastic Load Balancing health checks so that any problematic instance is not sent traffic while the problem persists. Now, S3 that I'm using for my static assets and the Elastic Load Balancing Service itself are designed to be highly available out of the box. Usually, when you go from one server to multiple servers, there are a few questions to ask about your application. The first thing is, how does this web application handle user sessions? Where does it store them? If it stores them on the local file system, you can imagine that server one and server two now have different information about my users. They are not in sync. Luckily, when it comes to WordPress, this is not a problem because WordPress is pretty much stateless. It relies a lot on cookies to store uh, state information. For example, it has an authentication cookie that it validates against the database. If you have installed any plugins that don't follow this model, perhaps they are using the native PHP sessions, then you might need to think about this problem. For example, you might want to move that into DynamoDB outside of your web server. There is a PHP session handler for DynamoDB that you can download and install. When it comes to user uploads, I have the exact same question. Where are they stored? And by default, WordPress stores them on the local file system. If I am an administrator and I upload an image, it will end up in one of the two servers. That's a problem. But luckily, we have already moved that workload to S3, which is a shared resource for all the web servers. So that's not a problem as well. The other challenge that I might have is how do I maintain the same version of code and configuration on all my web servers? Later on, I'm going to show a simple approach by using Elastic Beanstalk to solve that problem. Then for my database, I also need high availability there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to upgrade my RDS instance to be a multi-AZ one. Now, RDS is going to maintain a synchronously replicated instance in a different availability zone. And there will be an automatic failover if there is an issue with the primary node. When it comes to Elastic Cache, Elastic Cache is going to automatically replace individual nodes that might fail. It's also a good practice to have multiple cache nodes and spread them to different availability zones. And you can do that with the flexible node placement feature of Elastic Cache. Now, my friend, uh, going back to our story with the restaurant, uh, learned about online marketing tools. And those would drive spikes of traffic to his website. So I needed to, again, optimize the architecture. I have done all the hard work already. I have a stateless architecture for my web servers. So I can use auto-scaling so that, for example, when there is high CPU utilization, we will trigger an alarm automatically. And that will initiate an auto-scaling event that will add, for example, two more web servers. And those will be automatically attached behind the Elastic Load Balancing Service. The opposite will happen when I have low CPU utilization, which is a great way to save cost, because I will only use the resources that I really need at any given point in time. Next, I might need to scale the database to prepare for those spikes. I can, of course, increase the size of my RDS instance. I can upgrade it. Or I can use more storage or faster storage with provisioned IOPS, for example. But remember that WordPress is a read-heavy application. So a slightly more efficient way to uh, scale my database is to add more nodes, read replicas. And read replicas are not supported by WordPress out of the box. So you will need to install a plugin. There is a plugin called HyperDB. 
The only problem with HyperDB is that there's an incompatibility between HyperDB and the W3 Total Cache plugin I mentioned before. They, there is a naming class. They both rely on a file that is called db.php. But this is something that you can tweak the code a bit to make it work. So how it looks, I can add one RDS read replica or more to scale my capacity to serve read kind of traffic. Now, what's the easiest way to launch such an architecture? I always prefer to use Elastic Beanstalk when it fits the framework. And in the case of WordPress, it pretty much does. How, but how would Elastic Beanstalk help us? Well, most probably you're going to introduce chains. Your website is not going to be cast in stone. You might want to develop your own themes or your own plugins, or maybe not. You might simply install new plugins once in a while or perform upgrades for WordPress. To minimize risk, you will need at least two environments, one for staging and one the production environment. You will perform changes first on the staging environment and then on production. Elastic Beanstalk makes it very easy for you to launch such environments. It hides a lot of the complexity that is required to, to do that on your own. It will also help us manage different versions of the application and decide when we want to push to the staging environment or to production. And let me give you an example. First of all, let me tell you how you would upload the application to Elastic Beanstalk. You would need to create a zip file that includes the application code. And also, you will need to create a PHP a config file, wp-config.php. And you upload it to Elastic Beanstalk. And Elastic Beanstalk will handle all the details of deploying that into your web servers. The best practice here because you want to push exactly the same application version to multiple environments, is to make your configuration file environment agnostic. This means that you shouldn't hard code details like the database endpoint, because this will be different on your staging and your production environment. One way to solve this problem is to use environmental variables. And in the case of Elastic Beanstalk, when you use RDS, it already pre-populates those uh, variables that you see on the screen. And here is an example of how you would introduce chains, how you would, for example, install a new plugin. So you have a staging environment that has maybe a single instance to save cost, and the, your elastic uh, load balanced infrastructure for your production environment. You will install the plugin first on the staging environment. Typically, when you install a new plugin, it results in some database changes, but also it might create some uh, files on the local file system. So that is a problem. We need to capture those file system changes. So we create a new zip file. And you see I color coded them uh, red and yellow. So we have the version 2 now as a zip file. And we can push that to the production environment. As a last step, we will still need to visit the administrative panel and trigger those database updates. So this is a very simple way to handle chains. And I'm going to hand over to Chris, who's going to share with you the details of uh, you know, how do you do that in a more sophisticated fashion in a large scale. Switch it on. Yeah, on the side there pad. we go. Awesome. Sorry. Good start. Oh, echoey. Um, yeah, so I'm Chris Pitchford from News UK. I'm the lead platform owner for Amazon Services inside the digital estate. Um, News UK, when I'm publishing house, we publish four national newspapers in the UK, The Times and The Sun, probably the most uh, well known of, of, of our set. Um, in our division, we uh, manage the websites. There's many websites. There's the title sites, but we also have a number of other corporate sites, microsites, and 
and uh, uh, of varying scales. And we're looking to use WordPress more and more as we go forward as a flexible content management system. Um, so traditionally, News UK uses large systems. We have a team of developers that work almost exclusively to power our title websites. Uh, teams of about 30, uh, 30 developers and testers. Um, they know the ins and outs of our large systems. They've spent years working with them, lots of time invested. Um, these systems, they're complicated. For them, it's difficult to introduce new features. Some, something as trivial as, say, uh, a questionnaire doesn't fit well inside our, our master CMS systems. And uh, it's, they try and add them, and if something goes wrong, it can be catastrophic. We have to roll back, and it can be weeks through our release process to get um, to new code with, repaired and bring the feature back online. Um, so we're looking at WordPress. WordPress developers, WordPress everywhere. Most of our developers, oh yeah, also do WordPress, which is a, a, a useful thing. And it's, it works so well for microsites. Anyone can run a WordPress um, single instance and with great results. Does it fit one inside AWS? This is a problem. I'm a cynical sysadmin, so I really don't trust it. I've fought for years to keep WordPress out of News UK, so it's a bit of a turnaround that me are talking about how we've adopted it. Um, we want to run it on AWS, clearly. What, 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 why would we be talking about anything else? Uh, single box solutions? No, we can stay right away. We're not, we're not happy with anything that's a single point of failure. We've, we've, in the past, we've done a lot of lift and shift work. We've taken systems that are physical boxes, we've taken VMware TIN, and we've moved them into the cloud. And this includes systems similar to WordPress. It's half a job, but it's, it's not utilizing the power of, of Amazon's web services. I like cloud solutions from the ground up. Horizontal scaling, absolute requirement. You know, it, if a product is 10 users today, something might go viral and it's a million users tomorrow. We need to be able to work and we have to be able to guarantee that we're able to cope with these, with these loads. Uh, unexpected downtime is, is a bugbear of mine. In, invariably, systems, if they have single points of failure, they fail at 3 in the morning or 4.30 on a Friday. It's it just the way things seem to work for me, and it's, it's not much fun. So that's what, that's what our drive was. How can, we, how can we get WordPress up and running, utilizing one of these great toys that uh, Amazon give us? So plug into the, they're the kicker. They're the trickiest things we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Terrible for auto-scaling. Things change file systems. They, they update bits of PHP code that they don't own, and they change database schemas. And they're hard to keep track of. As, as you've mentioned, there's clashes between na uh, with naming files will conflict with other ones. Stored config conflicts. It's just sometimes a bit of a pain in the ass. So uh, there's a, the issues we have is we tend to scale a lot. We're quite a cyclical site. We're very busy during the day, and we're silent during the night. But then again, we're quite busy when it comes to editorial workflows. So maybe at 3 in the morning, editorial will launch a new feature on a site, and they'll turn on a plugin, and that's going to screw things up. Because in the morning, when we scale up, the database is referring to a plugin that's no longer available on auto-scaling instances. It's bad. So rollbacks as well. When something goes wrong, how do we recover? If a plugin has upgraded itself as part of an installation, and we've gone to a new platform unzipping a, a stored zip file, what happens if we need to go back to an older version? Will the older version support the updated schema in the database, or is it going to throw some 500 errors and we're going to get problems rorted by users? So we thought long and hard about this, and we're being, we're being mean. I, th I, I still think there's, there's room for us to improve, but we pick the plugins very carefully. We vet them, and we give the users a menu of plugins. Uh, so we check that these plugins conform to certain best practices. Um, we use WordPress VIP. If you've not heard of WordPress VIP, it's a, it's a particularly good or possibly expensive platform. But they have quite a nice coding standard. And this invariably is to allow plugins to work on their, their sort of cloud offering as well. So we use that as the basis for our tests and our, and our scrutiny uh, to make sure that plugins behave themselves. Writing data to the local file system. Why are you doing that? You know that data is going to go in the bin the moment we scale down. So we have automated testing to pick out these things. Started off, sounds terrible, it started off as grep. You know, can we look for certain functions? What are you doing? Where are the F rights and bits and pieces inside the PHP code? Why are you doing that? What's it for? What's the motivation? Is it temporary? Is it going to be cleaned up afterwards? Is it going to hemorrhage disk space? Bits and pieces like that. These are things that we try and pick out automatically. So this, uh, this is our, um, our approach to, to sort of looking at plugins. 
Con configuration is a, another serious component. We hate hard-coded values. Um, hard-coded values, that means someone can le leave an old value in there. If you're rolling back, is the rollback value still good for now if we go back to a version that was released last week? Terrible idea. So we try to dynamically set values. We calculate values from things like cloud formation and, uh, and, and dynamic information, uh, information that's tied to the environment that we're running. And IEM credentials are fantastic. So we've seen, as you mentioned, some of the plugins that allow you to store assets on S3, they'll ask you for an AWS key. Why are they asking you for an AWS key? Surely the role that the EC2 instance is running in contains all the information you need to connect to S3 and upload content, but also possibly retrieve the content if it needs to do work on it later. So we've got our hands dirty in the past. We've patched open products, and we're working to get these patches pushed back upstream. So we've taken some standard AWS plugins, and we've forced them to support uh, session tokens and roles. So they no longer ask us for credentials. They merely know what the credentials are going to be, and they rotate as required in, in the estate. And that's a, that's a key thing. I think from that, I think it's safe to say, don't be too scared of getting your hands dirty. If a plugin doesn't do what you want, if it doesn't feel like it's cloud compatible, get in there, see if you can improve it, and release it back to the community. So our release process is the scariest part of what we do. It's, it, it, it scares me. We have an enterprise system. We use Ant Hill, um, uh, mainly GitHub as well, to, to keep our code. And it's a fantastic solution. It's push a button, and the releases happen. We go through various environments or stages. We go from UAT, testing, dev, SI, staging, and then up onto production. And we make heavy use of CloudFormation to try and ensure that the environments are the same. If we do something on the staging environment, when we replay it, is it going to be exactly the same on the production environment, or will it be different? Does it matter that the staging environment maybe only has one uh, uh, WordPress server running because it's such low load, but in production we have eight because we're under heavy load all the time? Does that, will that make a difference to the release process? So we have um, a lot of testing goes into that, uh, rolling forwards and rolling back. Uh, that's quite, a, quite an important thing. Um, each of our websites um, is wrapped around a deployable lump of code. It was a pleasure today to hear about um, Code Deploy, because we've been doing something similar in-house for a long time. And uh, one of the things I'll be taking away from, from reInvent is that we need to move over to Code Deploy. So I'm, I'm pleased about that. But um, it's, we store all of our code at the moment inside, very similarly to Elastic Beanstalk, inside um, files that are retained on on S3 storage. Um, this is great for rolling forwards, but we, for the rollback process, we also need to bear in mind backups of databases. So unlike our large content management systems that we use to power the titles at the moment, where we do have, uh, because it's in-house code, we have rollback functionality in the code. If, you, if we need to go back to the old version, here's the undo process. In WordPress, we don't. We have a recovery process. It went wrong. Let's restore to a point in time. That drives us with fail quickly. We want to know that the website isn't working as soon as possible after the release. But it means that we're also practicing our disaster recovery process at the same time. If we have a release that happens and say there's a screw up with some CSS and some text is overflowing, we treat that as a disaster. So the disaster recovery process is to build a new system. We build it using the database snapshots with the assets held inside S3 and we get the service up and running as quickly as possible. We also use CDNs. We're a big user of CDNs. So the solution we have has to sit neatly with, uh, with the variety we use. Uh, we don't use CloudFront at the moment. We want to use CloudFront, and uh, I'm hoping we're going to be able to soon. But um, URLs don't always point to live solutions. If we want to replicate something, the same thing that affects the CDN also affects replication. If we take all of our data inside our production environment, what's going to happen to the URLs? So the developers want to, want to implement a new feature. They need live data, but they need it in a test environment. It doesn't work if all the links still point to www.mysite.com. So this is a challenge we have. How do we solve this problem and uh, allow us to move the data between environments and keep things up and running? Another thing is around S3 buckets. We can't have an S3 bucket per installation. That's hugely wasteful. We, 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 one of our, we have many accounts, and we are running out of buckets all the time. It's a, it's a waste. I, I'm, I'm not keen on it. So CloudFormation, with, uh, uh, it solves a lot of our testing problems. It really does. It means we can replicate environments. We can replicate from S3 storage uh, from, a, from a, known, a known good version, and we can... Uh, 
we can use snapshots of databases to, to pull back in point in time for our live content. Um, all of our URLs on our site, and this sounds very against the grain, but they're all site relative, and that negates the problem with the host name. So this, it, as well as allowing us to then move between environments, we can bring it back into testing, we can bring it back into staging. It also allows us to test individual components of our environment. So in the case where we're using the CDN, the CDN obviously would provide www, but we could go to the origin, which may be uh, an ELB, or we could go to an individual box, and all of the links and all of the content, they all still work in exactly the same way. It's the same look and feel. So we have a problem with a cache layer, with a CDN layer, with a load balancer layer, if there's something wrong with SSL, we can track it down and we can keep the site working. It gives us a nice, clean view. It also lets us do some interesting things with backups, because if all of the URLs are site relative, we can scrape them and keep them somewhere as a backup, and we can scrape them from any point in, in, in the stack and retain that information. So we built something called the Apache Router that helps us use uh, S3 buckets. This, the Apache Router uh, is an in-house product called Olsop, which we've been developing for about 18 months now. And this helped us facilitate some of these problems. Um, it, it kind of sounds like it's been done a million times, why we want, we're trying to do it all over again, but there are some niche benefits. Um, one of the key things we have is during a release process, if we want the whole site to be configured through an API. This is, comes down to the infrastructure as code sort of idea. We want the web routing to, to work from a code perspective. So we have an API to configure how traffic is going to reach our servers. And this is particularly important where we have stacked websites. So we might have www.times.co.uk, but www.times.co.uk slash redbox, which exists, is a WordPress site. So we use the router to direct traffic into our different environments. And we use this API to place WordPress in these individual locations. And this is good because it means we can actually take a WordPress site and move it to a different folder. And we can do this through the API rather than having to mess around inside WordPress. It integrates really well with CDNs. So we can have, um, uh, for, for caching capabilities, we can flush the site. We have a flush name. So if somebody says, oh, this page looks stale, just browse to flush.thetimes.co.uk and that page will be refreshed. And it'll be refreshed inside Elastic Cache with, with objects. It'll be flushed inside, say, Akamai as our CDN, or Varnish, or whatever caching name we have. It gets propagated through our network, and it gets flushed and refreshed as quickly as possible. And we can also share S3 buckets, and this is critical. So in a situation where, say, for example, we had 100 gig of assets held inside uh, S3 storage, we don't want to move all of these assets into a UAT bucket or into a staging bucket. So what we have is a tiered approach. We know S3 will scale infinitely. So what we will do is our UAT environment will try and collect an object from a UAT bucket, and if it's not there, it will go to the production bucket. So UAT can play with live content in a read-only view, but any new content always goes into the UAT bucket, so it's isolated. Uh, we can trash the UAT bucket, and they can start again. So they can replay from a known point in time, from a database backup and from, an, from the production S3 content, and they can mix, mix and match as they go along. So that's quite a useful feature. There's other, other fringe benefits as well, and this goes against what, uh, what was said earlier on, and that is we do serve S3 objects through Apache, but we do that because we're paranoid and uh, because we use a paywall solution. So our, our publications are, are behind uh, subscription, and this means we don't want assets to be available readily directly from S3. So we have two ways of doing this. We, we proxy it through our, uh, our web servers, but we also sign URLs. So the URLs, the links to the S3 assets are signed so that they're only valid for a specific length of time when you hit S3. So that's a facility that S3 offers, and we utilize that as well. Uh, other things it, it does, it integrates with Tomcat, other PHP and Rails applications, so it's, it's kind of a, a generic tool. But the, the last thing that's absolutely fantastic is the ability to to scrape the sites, that are, uh, any assets that are live, any objects that are served can be scraped and pushed onto S3 storage. And at a moment's notice, we can say serve from S3, which means we can turn the web servers off if they're, for example, compromised, not that we get hacked too often, um, and we can continue to serve a, a copy of the sites. And we're working on a, a project um, which is sort of akin to Time Machine, so we can actually version the data that's held inside the bucket and we can go back. So if the compromise happens at 12 p.m., we can go back to what the website was like at 10 a.m. And that's a really useful feature for, for business continuity rather than disaster recovery. We're not recovering the service, but we're keeping the lights on just the same. 
So we're hoping to open source this as well. So we'll, we'll see how that goes through the lawyers, but um, Apache and, and, and Varnish and probably Nginx if, if I can get around to it. So yeah, that's, that's how we do it. It's, uh, the, the main thing to take away is don't be afraid to get messy. Get inside plugins and, and nail them down because the plugins will be the things that wreck your infrastructure. So that's, yeah, that's, that's what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Uh, some next steps, some interesting topics uh, that you might want to attend after that. If you want to take it to the next level with deployments and blue-green uh, deployments and uh, tools like Elastic Beanstalk and Opsworks, these sessions might be interesting. Thank you very much. I will be outside for questions. If anybody has questions for me, uh, very happy to take them. Thank you very much. <laughs>